wealth managers great place to go after. However, then you said something which was really interesting, which is, you know, the governments and not I'm not talking you're not talking about the government of Switzerland or the United States government. You're talking like the city of Syracuse or maybe counties or you know, maybe it's state level. They have a very different investment mandate, right? Whereas the the wealth managers, let's say, let's be honest, their number one job is to not lose money for their clients. But when it comes to a government, whether it's a small government or a, a retirement plan, a pension plan, same kind of idea. We don't want to lose money, but a government says... Hey there, welcome back to the Angels Exits and Acquisitions podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Barnes. And today we're talking with Mirko Kokoli out of Geneva, Switzerland. And we're talking about raising money from private institutions, private investors, as well as government agencies. And I think that if you are in the space of private equity, raising capital or investing into uh, private ventures, this is going to be a really unique and interesting conversation, um, especially the second half of the conversation where we get into a lot more of the details around what Mirko is doing. And I think you'll find some really incredible ideas when it comes to the creative way that you can finance big deals and acquire companies. So stay tuned, listen in, and as always, like, subscribe, and share. Take care. Welcome to Angels Exits and Acquisitions, the place to learn how to fund, scale, exit, and massively profit as an angel investor or entrepreneur. Brought to you by the Angel Investors Network. And now, here's your host, Jeff Barnes. All right, welcome back to another episode of Angels Exits and Acquisitions. I'm your host, Jeff Barnes, and I'm here today with Mirko Kokoli. And Mirko is over in Geneva, Switzerland right now, so a little bit later in the evening for him. But Mirko, how are you doing today? Very fine, thank you. Uh, thanks for Wonderful. Me. Well, absolutely. So happy to have you here today. And we're going to be talking about some, some really interesting topics here that I think a lot of folks will find it very interesting, which is around the areas of raising capital and private markets. So before we get into all of that, why don't you tell folks a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today? Yes, I, I'm a physicist. So I studied physics, but I always say that I'm still a physicist. And uh, um, during my studies in physics in Milan and then Berkeley, California, I had uh, uh, this idea of becoming a physicist in finance. And so after, uh, so when I finished my, my studies, I have been involved with, uh, first of all, with the Department of Energy, the United States. And then uh, uh, with the European Council for Nuclear Physics, where uh, I decided to go to school at night. And then at some point I got out and I have been for eight years managing equity funds in public markets. And uh, I decided to go in public markets right afterwards. So it was 2015. So I've been uh, almost 10 years in, in private markets doing some merger and acquisition activity that includes... Uh, so finding acquirers for company or finding capital and uh, raising capital ourselves for a vehicle and doing the acquisitions. So we have been involved with my company that is MPD Partners, basically in all the activities that are around the typical private equity profile, uh, private equity process, from uh, finding companies to capitalizing them to finding uh, capital increases. So... Um, we we have been invested also in a company that went for an IPO, and um, yeah, so we basically we had been experiencing directly all the the uh, private equity and and from raising capital to the buying companies, divesting company. At awesome. So I have to ask then because I started out my career in the nuclear navy. You know, learning nuclear engineering technology, and I'm in the capital raising space. A lot of folks ask me, how in the world did you go from that to where you are today? And I'm going to ask you the same thing. How did you go from wanting to be a physicist to all of a sudden raising capital, private and public markets? I, I, I think that's something that been stuck in my mind sim, uh, since I was uh, an early teenager in which I I saw maybe the new. I, I remember this scene that I don't even remember who uh, that was about. I, I don't even know which exact person it was about, and it was about uh, a CEO uh, of a company, industrial company, being uh, uh, I think, or maybe of a bank, uh, being a, a, a physics graduate, 
And so it <laughs> it goes in my mind and eventually I decided that I liked the topic physics, but the more I've been studying and, and physics and going to seminars and conferences, I, rea- I realized that uh, there is more output for uh, physics and engineering in general uh, in finance than one thinks when feasibly things to sign up for uh, the te- technical, uh, the typical STEM, right? So the, st- the, st- the STEM uh, study career, it's, uh, uh, it's quite a bit of uh, presence in, in, in then a professional career in, in finance in general and investments. Well, you know, I hear you on that one. However, when somebody goes into physics, it's because, you know, they like the science, they like maybe engineering, it's, it's math, it makes sense, right? And sometimes money, people don't look at it the same way. Of course, it's a lot of math and financial engineering is one of the <laughs> things we talk about as well. So, you know, when you, when you talk about that, was there a draw? Like you said, you, you were thinking about this when you were younger. Um, was it a draw towards making money? Was it a draw towards understanding how money moved? Like, what was it that really got you to say, okay, let's, let's look into this a little bit more? Yeah, if I if I were in a in a leadership class, I would say that the 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 the, the psychology behind it is that maybe I I, I had this uh, early psychology psychological profile in which I I need uh, to to um, to be smart, meaning uh, I need I need to be in the room, the guy that can say I <laughs> I have a smart profile. I, you know, I teach in the University of Geneva and uh, to, to, to students, I say, if you look at my CV, I'm very smart and then you get to know me, maybe, maybe you change your mind, you know? So it's, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I needed to, to go down that road and I knew that physics was difficult. So it was also about the challenge and also about un- understanding the essence and the detail of how things work in general, right? Because in, in case you go down to the detail of how, matter works and how yeah that's I, I think that it's a little bit of the, what it is and I, I can tell that today I have that approach in finance I've been in finance for a long time I have that approach meaning I I, 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 I don't for example something that I don't like is when I get in meetings and there is someone that uh, talks about um, try to sell me a uh, 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 maybe a concept or a result or a product, but without an analytic uh, analysis and explanation behind. So that right. doesn't really fit very well with me. So, yeah. No, that makes sense. And it makes sense given your background, which, you know, now I want to talk, you know, because I think it's, it's important what you just said, which is there's different ways to pitch different people, right? And a salesperson generally doesn't talk about the statistics, the analysis, the risk of um, mitigation factors, you know, the risk analysis of, a, of an investment opportunity and like that. Um, and I'd imagine that's something that is very valuable for your team to have you in so you can kind of dive into that a little bit. So why don't you take us back to, you know, when you first got into the finance world and you said you worked with private equity and, and raising capital. Um, can you give us an example of one of the times that you were looking at deals and you said, hey, you know what? I really want to learn a little bit more about how do I analyze a deal? What was some of that um, work that you put into this that you found really intriguing? Actually, it's funny. I, I, I like to generalize and to say it happens all the time because it's very rare, the analytic mindset in the industry. And there is another big problem uh, is that what we experienced is that, uh, okay, first of all, we have been mostly focusing on, on Europe. Uh, because I'm Italian by origin, I tend to be attracted by by deals there. So a little bit of Italian angle, uh, even if I, it's not because I, I like it, but it's because, I mean, <laughs> the industry calls me to go there. And mm-hmm. um, I think that there is something that is very important to know. Since beginning of quantitative easing, the 12th and 13th of March, 2009, for 15, almost 15 years, there's been low interest rates and uh, uh, okay. a call for uh, a strong appetite, of course, in uh, risk. And so private equity um, found itself being uh, also being only partially invested, but very heavily allocated. And we, 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 we witnessed something that's sort of obvious. In the, I don't want to say something that is obvious, but I mean, it's, 
the, the real witness, uh, what we're being witnessing is that, first of all, a lot of, for example, pension fund obliged to invest because, I mean, they need to allocate the money. They already decided they went, wanted to go into the into private equity, but unable to deploy, even having a number of opportunities. Meaning, knowing the investment opportunities, they knew that they wanted, that they, they already decided that they needed to invest, but unable to select. And why? Because all this appetite for risk <coughs> that multiplied the size of in the industry by 30 times it created something that they call a stupid industry. Yeah, now unqualified industry. But it's not because I say I, I'm so smart that I can say that. No, no, not at all. It's because technically speaking, private equity. For private markets, they tend to be, let's say, private equity is big part of private markets, right? <coughs> Sorry. So private equity... The typical fund is 10 years long. You, if in less than 15 years you multiply, multiply by 30 the size of the industry, it means that most of the industry is made by unqualified people. It's, it's, and that's, you see the size of the scientific way to see that. It means that's point number one. Point number two is that I clearly see, saw from uh, when I started in Europe in 2015, Obviously, different regions, they have different advancement in the way private equity is executed. But since 2015 until, uh, uh, let's say, for five years, <coughs> there's been, <coughs> there's been a, a huge shift between the tendency of private equity to be only senior professionals. Yeah? So all the junior part, let's say, all the, call it, to give it an age, uh, all the below 35, 40 years old was not existing before. And uh, uh, and deals were done. I, I I tend to be sarcastic about it. Uh, they were done at the bar, yeah. So it means like lobbyist type of uh, you go, you say, ah, let's do this, let's do that. But and then of course you were sending in like be consulting first, maybe doing due diligence and doing the proper work. Like in, you can see even in the old movies like uh, Barbarians at the Gate, right? When you see the Novisco buyout, in which you have the people staying up at night, that happens since. It has always happened, but the company, the private equity company itself, it was very uh, small in number of head headcount, and now they became bigger. So it, it, I, I I summarize saying it is an industry that went from deals done at the bar to deals uh, by analyst deals. It means that you have your analyst; they go properly into the digging into the topic, analyzing, and Comparing. So that's the other big thing is you don't look at a deal and you say, okay, let's see how we can do that. First thing is you look at a deal and you say, okay, how does this compare to the other opportunities we have? So there is a big difference between trying to make a deal work alone or try to be, or, or have all the, the people that allow you to have a, a certain origination, you know, size of origination that allow to compare. Because comparing it's simpler. Yeah, and it doesn't force uh, it doesn't force you to make a deal work. But it, you actually select it. That it's a different. Well, so if I can summarize, you know, like you were saying, the the good old days, if you will, of private equity was relationship capital, and you're sitting at a bar, you have a deal, you tell the story. Oh, it sounds great. Let's go do that. And private equity became and is still very very profitable for the the right types of companies. Some of them still fail course and not everybody hits bats 100 percent but um you know when they did these deals they were doing it off of you know i understand the industry i like the thing i like the deal i like the opportunity and they would go forth and they'd work together right and what you're saying is that there was a big shift towards this analytical aspect of it and trying to say okay well why did something work why did something fail let's figure out what the bright spots are from the things that work how do we you know structure our, our models around that so we can then go out there and find deals that are going to fit this model more. Is that accurate? Um, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, considering that uh, on top, the private equity firms themselves, they, they, they became equipped with internal personnel. And uh, uh, that means that you have uh, a, a 20 to 40 years old 
now let's say what in 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 my jargon it's uh, analyst associates and and manage, junior manager let's say level that uh, got created but there are two problems first of all is that in order to be an experienced person in private equity it takes uh, and it, if you go with the traditional requirements of the investment industry you need to have uh, uh, typically in, in equity funds, like it was before, you have three years of track record. Basically, daily NAV or a monthly NAV, it doesn't matter, but three years. Those three years in private equity would be 20 or 30 years, right? So it, it, it means that uh, at best you have someone that is able to do an analysis, but like a consultant, but not really with an investment background. So, yes, uh, yeah. I think that there is a lot of, uh, it's not analysis, but also anal when I say analysts, it means really with the, with, with the people uh, populated the industry. So I think it, it, it has still a little bit of time to go before getting mature. And uh, good that it started because I mean, now I mean with interest rates going down uh, slowly, but steadily, if that trend continues, there will be still capital going in the private market. So fundraising should become easier again um, pretty soon. I mean, it's gradually improving. Before continuing, please subscribe and share this video to help us reach more people and stay notified of our latest releases. Now, let's continue watching and learning. Well, I want to, I'm glad you hit on that, right? Because you know, a lot of folks will ask me, well, how hard is it to raise capital? And I have to tell them, listen, there's roughly $3.7 trillion, give or take, sitting in dry powder right now in private yep. equity alone, never mind corporate capital that's sitting there and retirement plan capital that's sitting. Like there's money, more money now than there ever has been, really, right? But to your point, a lot of people get really worried about what's happening in the public sector. They get really scared about what's happening in the interest rates and economy. So, but that doesn't mean that you get to stop raising capital, right? When you are a private equity firm or you're an LP or, you, know, or you, you are a fund manager of any kind of fund, you're obligated to raise money. So what changes strategically or tactically for you when the markets themselves change or is it anything? Um. Okay, I deal. I I I personally don't like large deals, so I look at SMEs. So we have a specific. Uh, I I like companies in which I can go in and understand the company as a whole, so all the company, right. the totality of the company. So meeting, I can meet all the employees basically. So you go up to uh, 300, 400 employees maximum. So that means that typically you are below 100 million in revenue. Yeah, right. That's a typical side. If you are in this type of deals, the market is less efficient, you know, by the market right. efficiency type of uh, definition. So it's more unstandard, non-standard, no, non, not standardized. It means that I think it's more likely that irrespective of the, the, the business cycle moment or the, 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 the interest rate or appetite or uh, M&A activity going on, you always have opportunities more than for very large corporates that are more dependent on the global economy, generally speaking, on the business side. So I'm not very concerned about uh, in which moment I do the deal. I'm more concerned about the investor appetite because they get uh, they get scared. Yeah, mm -hmm. they say if the M and A market is a little bit dry. So you cannot do transactions uh, if it's difficult to raise capital in general because there is a little bit of general risk aversion because of uh, geopolitical risk or uh, whatever it is. And then investors tend not to follow. I mean, from and so what kind of investors are you typically talking to when you're doing deals this size, you're raising money into the private equity? Are you going after institutions? Are you going after just I know with individuals, family office, like who do you guys generally go after when you're talking, uh, having these conversations? We go, uh, okay, living in Geneva, let's say, give us access to uh, quite a bit of wealth management uh, connections that um, have relevant wealth as well. So it can go from private individual managed or not managed. So through wealth managers or um, 
family offices that could be single or multifamily offices. So it's more like private wealth. So institutional, um, it, it's still a bit early for us, especially if we do deal by deal. Right. To give you an idea, there is a company here in Geneva for which we, actually there are two companies for which we raised the uh, uh, state of New York money. Uh, so go- government funding. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a, it's an equity raise, but this is also an interesting um, part of the of the raising space is where you go to governments that have the typical quantitative easing or economic development money that are allocated. It's strange because it's that that it, I was telling you that it's I I'm not in institutional. This is even worse, right? It's even well, it's gov- governmental. But there are a lot of opportunities in getting funding there because uh, the duty of the government is to deploy money in uh, uh, for economic development. And uh, if you are in a, uh, if you are a company raising, and you raise in an industry that is interesting for for a for a region, or you have maybe some you have the case of a state of New, so sent uh, upper state New York. So talking about Manhattan, uh, the 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 more uh, more like uh, Syracuse and, uh, and 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 the likes, they they tend to um, yeah to to be clustered. So they have some sectors that they like. So if you are if you happen to be in that sector and you say, hey, I can re- relocate there, and I do a small, very small plan for employment, then they will give you money. So they that's they, interesting. They, so. So let me, I, I want to recap that a little bit for everybody. First off, um, yeah, I definitely understand what you're saying. When it comes down to raising capital, you know, I, I like the one-to-many approach as opposed to one-to-one, right? So the wealth managers, the people that have access to books of business, they they already manage money or they advise clients, right? So yep. wealth managers, great place to go after. However, then you said something which was really interesting, which is, you know, the governments and not, I'm not talking, you're not talking about the government of Switzerland or the United States government. You're talking like the city of Syracuse or maybe counties or you know, maybe it's state level, but they have a very different investment mandate, right? Whereas the the wealth managers, let's say, let's be honest, their number one job is to not lose money for their clients. Their number two job is to make them more money, right? <laughs> but, but we always want to talk about number one job is don't lose the capital in the first place. But when it comes to a government, whether it's a small government or a retirement plan, a pension plan, same kind of idea. We don't want to lose money, but a government says, hey, we want to create economic development, right? Economic stimulus. And so what you said is, I also want to come, uh, I might go to those people if I have a deal on the table where if we win the deal, if we get the, the job done, it's going to create some sort of economic incentive for the local government. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, typically the the, the 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 basic KPI is unemployment, meaning so if you create such employment, uh, good, and especially in the target in their target, that t- typically it's a sector. Yes, so to reconcile the two, the idea is um, I'm very likely to go to investor and say, hey, I have this possibility, I need to raise capital for this company, or I can go and buy the company so you can follow me in in a, in a, in investing, and if you invest. And the, or if even if I get a commitment, I take the commitment and the business case, I go to some governments where I think that I can raise and I tell them, listen, I can bring an investor that invests in the company. If you give me some extra money, he's giving my investor some confidence that there is uh, some extra liquidity, you know, extra anti-dilutive or non-dilutive type of uh, cap- capital uh, uh, contribution. So is 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 giving strength to the investment case, and on the other hand, you government you have uh, um, very often is FDI, it's foreign direct investment that are very appreciated, or at least not not regional, meaning uh, investments not coming from that region. So you attract private capital to invest in companies that are happy to develop uh, a company in your com- in your county. In 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 the case I was mentioning, it was a state of New York. So mm-hmm. it's uh, so, uh, a. I want to try and follow this trail a little bit because I think it gets a little bit confusing for a lot of folks, which is, you know, you don't necessarily go after the, the investor first in this case, right? 
Uh, you might go after the investor first if you're saying, okay, I'm raising money into a private equity fund and I need capital to do that. That makes sense, right? But in this case, it sounds like you've identified an opportunity that fits the thesis of your fund. And you say, okay, this opportunity is here. We like this. Here's how much capital we're going to need. Whether it's 10 million, 100 million, whatever that number is, this is the kind of capital we're going to need to make the acquisition, to do the deal, to do the turnaround, whatever. And again, I we haven't gotten into all the details of your fund, but you're going to find those and probably put together, I'd imagine, LOI first. And, and then do you use that LOI to then go to the government and talk to them? Or is there a term sheet that you get to first? Like, how do you guys work that normally? Yeah. Uh, so, um, first of all, typically we know in advance which government we are talking to, meaning, uh, so we do the other way around because we have this partnership in a, in a state of New York, what we, what we, we know roughly what are the programs they have. So when you look at companies... So, you, so you're going out there and actively looking for opportunities that will solve some of those problems. So you'll already fit that box. Uh, I, I, yes, in order not to be okay. you know, all over the place, to be a bit focused. Typical example is if I need to buy a company in Germany and the Germany is uh, uh, with 30 million in revenues, let's say. So not, not very big. It's typical uh, typical current target of private equity for uh, SMEs. Uh, and they, they ob- let's say, it's very likely that they export. Maybe they have a scope for exporting in the United States. Yeah, practical example. They are a company doing furniture. So okay. when they sell to the United States, they sell the furniture, right? So I can go to state of New York and say, listen, I have this company. I can invest in the company. I invest potentially in expansion, expansion capital, like growth capital. And, and uh, uh, I can put a factory here that does the assembly. So when they ship, they will ship at a lower cost because the assembly is in, in, uh, uh, unmounted. And so we do the assembly of the table of the furniture here in uh, Syracuse. So that is creating an added value for the company. And on top, it's subsidized. So for me as an investor, I know that I have a good case, not only because of the classic business plan, but because in the business plan, I'm, I'm plugging in a government funding. I love that. And I think it's, a lot of folks... It's an internal, inter, internal, internationalization play. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'd imagine you know more than one language other than English, so it's not a problem. You know, you probably know more more languages than most people in the United States. <laughs> so it, I'll forgive you. It's in, yeah, for the international side, no problem at all. Um, so, you know, I think this is really important for a lot of capital raisers to understand, which is there's more than, you know, excuse the term, but more, more than one way to skin a cat, right? A lot of folks will look at this and say, oh, man, and, and I... I always combat this mentality with a lot of cavalry. I have to go after one specific type of investor so that I know them inside and out. And that's the only person I'm going to raise capital from. But what you're saying is that, listen, there are opportunities out there where you have a different type of capital stack. You might say, okay, we want the private individuals that we already have great relationships. They'll put in, you know, 20, 30, 40% of the deal, which will be great. And we'll make that happen. Then you might have the institutional side that can come in and add a little bit more from a debt or equity perspective if needed. But then the third piece is, you know, the government side, which is I have a different incentive altogether, which is I want to see unemployment go down. I want to see, you know, the economy grow. And I love the thing that you said, which is the manufacturing. We're not changing the location of the factory. We're not doing we want to grow this company. Of course, you acquire the company, you want to grow it. That's how you get your returns back. How can we do that? Well, they ship most of their products over to the United States. How about we go and we work with this organiz- this government entity over here who has capital to invest and they're looking for economic development and they're looking to reduce their unemployment and we give them an incentive to also partake in this deal. Are they looking for returns on that side or are they really just looking for, because I can't imagine it's a handout, it right? Does. But how does that work generally? Okay. Uh, the- Typical example that we know about is um, that they have a portfolio of objectives. It means that exactly. they have. I, we have the case of an entity that is spending uh, uh, six to eight hundred million per year, uh, and uh, they in, so they they use this money in different ways. They use it as uh, equity funding, 
uh, typically, typically it's convertible. It means that they don't really, reality is that they don't really convert, but let's say they take like a debt uh, with, with conditions like the, the, the company uh, is never obliged to reimburse, meaning it can reimburse if it, if it willing to reimburse. It's, it's very strange. It looks like, yeah. And uh, other cases are uh, uh, if, if, you, if you need to refurbish a factory, they give you funding because they're specifically interested in uh, uh, real estate refurbishing. So they, they provide quite a bit of capital there. And so this is simply paying the bills for refurbishing. In other cases, could be a uh, loan. So mm -hmm. loan or guarantees on loan. So they guarantee for you with a bank in order for you to be able to take some uh, debt capital. That it, as a bare minimum, it's uh, reducing by quite a bit your interest rates or cost of uh, debt capital. That summarizes. It's, a, it's an interesting model, right? And again, it just comes down to the more creative you can be, the, the more opportunities there will end up becoming, which is, again, a stark contrast from physics, right? Yep. <laughs> you know, uh, there's only so many ways you could possibly disprove gravity, and I haven't found any of them really yet. But, um, you know, when it comes to your background, Mirko, I think there's just a, a lot there. I, I love this conversation. I love learning how you take this analytical approach to how you do this, but you've tied in some really creative ways to to bring capital to the table and make deals happen. So this has been been amazing. Um, why don't you tell folks, how can they reach out to you? How can they find you online or find your guys' company and learn a little bit more about you? Yeah, I have my, my, my name is Mirko Coccoli. It can be found on LinkedIn normally. With a little note, I mean, maybe it tend to be not too restrictive. That's a possibility. Our website is uh, www.mpdpartners.ch. Uh, can have a look at that. We have a little bit, we have a, uh, on our website, we have a section in which we talk about our, we have a club fund, yeah, sort of a club. So some individuals that put some personal money to, to, Establish like a network, establish like a, you know, participate to a network. And they are mostly executives from uh, multinational corporations. They put personal money. Uh, it's an interesting read. And uh, there are the contact, contact team from the website too. Beautiful. Well, we will make sure we get all of that information into the show notes. And thank you again, Mirko, so much for being here today. I really do appreciate it. Uh, fascinating con conversation, and I know that people would love to learn more about this this model and this mindset of you know, going out and raising capital for some of these larger deals and whatnot. So we'll encourage everybody to go check out our show notes and go learn a little bit more about Mirko. So Mirko, thank you, thanks again so much for being here today. Thank you very much. It has been a great pleasure. Absolutely. And so for those of you out there watching and listening, thank you again for being here at the Angels Exits and Acquisitions podcast and looking forward to seeing you on the next one. Take care.